Good evening. evening. Welcome to our, well, I think it's our fifth Wednesday evening together, but uh, our fourth week of regular Lenten midweek services. We continue our Places of the Passion trip through Matthew chapter 26. Tonight we follow directly from uh, the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was arrested at our uh, reading last week into the courtyard of Caiaphas, who is the high priest. Uh, Jesus goes on trial two times uh, during the final couple of days of his life, and this will be then the first trial. We will gather again next uh, Wednesday evening for Lenten midweek, and then the following week is Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, uh, Easter Sunday, then Sunday the 4th of April. If you're able, please rise as we enter into worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us ever walk with Jesus to see the depths of his love, to behold the gift of his forgiveness, to gaze upon the heights of his grace, to marvel at the magnitude of his mercy. We follow Christ to the courtyard. It belongs to the high priest Caiaphas. But Peter is there, and so are others. Peter denies Jesus three times. But all is not lost. After his collapse, God's grace is amazing. Faithful Lord, with me abide. I shall follow where you go.
Gracious and most merciful Father, in the light of your holiness, I see myself as I really am, and I am guilty. I confess that I have impure thoughts and unclean lips. I think too highly of myself and too little of others. I cling too tightly to the treasures of this world. That I cannot open my hands to receive blessings from you. My feet walk in the path of sin. I wander astray and become a stranger to righteousness. Forgive me and set me again on the path that leads to life. Deal with me not as I deserve, but according to your mercy. Not because I am worthy, but because you are gracious. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear the good news. Jesus walked to places of rejection, suffering, torment, and death for you. Jesus was determined to go to Gethsemane, Gabbatha, and Golgotha for you. That's why Jesus forgives you completely and loves you eternally. Faithful Lord, with me abide. I shall follow where you guide. Merciful and mighty Father, like Peter, we can make great boasts. Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. When we fail and fall and get lost in guilt, restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Last week we began reading in Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant chapter. The prophet Isaiah was looking forward to the Messiah, uh, who Isaiah calls the suffering servant in these chapters. And the striking thing is that this Messiah would be one who is suffering and rejected and despised and was a challenge to the notion of what people thought a Messiah should be. And so we continue. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out, off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities." Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Our second reading tonight comes from James chapter 2. James writing to the church. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, You've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There ends the reading. 
If you are able, please rise for the gospel. We pick up the story from last week. Judas showed up in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, kissed Jesus on the cheek, and they arrested him and, and brought him to the, uh, the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard of Caiaphas, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you mean. And then he went out to the entrance, and another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. And then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. There's a famous British playwright by the name of Noel Coward, and uh, one time he played a trick on 20 of the most famous men in London. He sent each of these men an identical note that read, everybody has found out what you have done. If I were you, I would get out of town. All 20 men left town. I don't know if that's a true story or not, but that's the way it's passed down. All 20 left. And I must confess, I've played that game with my son a time or two, haven't I, Matthew? Oftentimes I'll say, buddy, I know what you did, so it'd sound better if it comes from you, giving him an opportunity to say anything. But he's on to the game now, and he says, nothing. And if I don't produce evidence, well, then he's off the hook. What if you got such a note in the mail? I know what you've done, and if I were you, I would get out of town. Well, what is it that comes to your mind as you receive that note, as you stand out in the driveway and you opened it up. What's your immediate reaction? Is it panic, perhaps? Time to confess? Or do you start mounting a cover-up operation? Or maybe you just decide you're going to rip it up and put it out of your mind and you're going to go and think about something else. What would you do if you got such a note in the mail? Well, poor St. Peter, he gets his mail spread all over the world because it makes its way into the scriptures. We feel for the guy. Tonight we are thinking about Peter again, our namesake, St. Peter. Actually, this is the third week in a row that Peter, uh, besides Jesus, has taken center stage in Matthew 26. A couple weeks ago, when we visited the Mount of Olives, we heard Jesus say that God was going to, in order to uh, fulfill prophecy of the Old Testament, God was going to strike down the shepherd and that the sheep of the flock then would be scattered. God was going to strike down his Messiah, and the disciples would be scattered. And Peter answered him and said, Though all of those guys fall away, I will never fall away. Jesus did reply to him at that point, Truly I tell you this very night, Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter, instead of being quiet, says, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so we read that two weeks ago. And then last week in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Judas shows up and kisses Jesus on the cheek, and as he is seized by the, uh, by the, uh, the Jewish authorities who had come for him, we read that one of those who was there with Jesus, and the Gospel of John reminded us that his, this was Peter who did this, Peter took out his sword and he struck off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. That was last week. And tonight, Peter comes up again. We see Peter fall into sin, a sin that he never, ever planned to fall into, a sin he swore he would never fall into. He told Jesus, I will never betray you. 
Peter's threefold denial hope ha- happens at the home of Caiaphas, who is the high priest. Jesus is taken there, of course, immediately after he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it is here that the Jewish leadership makes the decision that Jesus deter- uh, deserves death. Peter has followed Jesus. It said all the disciples scattered, but we know that Peter at least followed him to Caiaphas's house, and now he's kind of lingering out in the shadows at the edge of the courtyard. I wonder what made, or made Peter change his mind about never falling away. I wonder made him change his mind uh, about not wanting to die with Jesus, because a couple weeks ago he sounded pretty adamant. These are the kind of guy you want on your side. It sounded like Peter was going to stick with Jesus to the very end, and then a few verses later, it's all fallen apart. I wonder what made Peter change his mind. I don't think he had planned on that. Was he weaker than he imagined himself to be? Do you think maybe if he spoke up and, and bragged a little bit about how strong and bold he was, that perhaps he would muster that strength when the time came? Maybe he didn't think actually anything bad was going to happen to Jesus. Maybe he didn't think that he, good old Peter, who had walked on water, Peter, who was the first to say, I believe, Jesus, that you are the Christ, the Son of God, maybe he thought he was incapable of such cowardice and failure. Then again, you might not blame a guy if his self-preservation overrode his allegiance to Jesus when he saw how serious things were getting. We don't know what made Peter change his mind, but that's an interesting question to think about because we all do that all the time. Never doing that, not doing that again. What makes us change our mind? Maybe it was his simple human nature that made him to do it. What we do know is that each denial that Peter made, he dug himself deeper and deeper into a hole. Did you note the progression tonight in the three times that he denied Jesus? It just says the first time he denied it. I don't know the guy. It says the second time he denied it with an oath, right? Maybe, uh, well, I swear, or something to that nature. It was a little stronger and a little bolder. Why is that? He'd already denied Jesus once, but now he's, he's doing that thing that we do. He's, he's, he's starting to cover up. And oftentimes when you see people getting defensive, you kind of know that you've maybe touched a, a sore spot. He's starting to get defensive. He denied it with an oath the second time. The third time, he invoked a curse on himself. And he swore, I do not know that man. Invoked a curse upon himself. The English translation for this word is anathema. And an anathema means to be eternally condemned. Peter said, I will be eternally condemned if I know that man. It sounds like he's trying to cover up for something, isn't he? He invokes a curse on himself and he swears, I don't know the man. The only other time that I can remember this uh, word being used, and it's used prominently in Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is writing to that church at Galatia, and he says this to them. He says, if anyone comes into this town and preaches a different gospel to you than I preached, um, and for the people of Galatia, uh, there were those coming back in saying, well, you need to, uh, you, you can believe in Jesus, but you need to do this, and you need to do this, and you also need to do this which is contrary to what Paul said, is that, no, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the gospel, not adding more works to it. If anyone comes in here and preaches a different gospel, all the religions of the world are are going to one place. I saw an Oprah clip again came up in some of my teaching this week where she proclaims that all paths lead to one place. The Apostle Paul says this, if anyone preaches to you a different gospel than I preach to you, let them be anathematized. Let them be eternally condemned. This is the Apostle Paul very forcefully arguing with that church to not accept or listen to any other gospel. That is the kind of word that Peter invokes on himself after his third denial. I was trying to think of a modern day equivalent, and this is the best I could come up with. I cross my heart and hope to die and stick a needle in my eye. 
right? Have any of you ever say that one? Yeah, I see a couple of head nods there. You stop and think about that for a minute, you go, that's it. I don't, I'm not going to make a promise like that. I'm going to stick a needle in my eye. That's awful. And I guess that is a euphemism from somewhere in Britain in the past. I didn't want to read too much about it. But um, this is oftentimes how people try to get you to believe what they are saying, is you will go to that length. Peter invokes a curse on himself, and he swears. And so when the rooster finally crows as predicted, and Peter remembers those words of Jesus from two weeks ago that we heard on the Mount of Olives, it says he went out and he wept bitterly. Remorse, regret, bitter sorrow, betrayal, all of these things come flooding down on St. Peter. This past Sunday, we read the Apostle Paul from our second reading. We were reading in Romans chapter 5. And Paul says this to the people, uh, the church at Rome. He said, God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God here is not going to operate any different with St. Peter. God was not done with Peter, even if Peter felt like he was eternally condemned. He'd actually done that to himself. You ever spoken hard words to yourself? You've decided if I screw this one up, it's all over. Eternally condemned. God will never love me again. This is where Peter is at. And yet, the good news of the gospel is this, that God was not done with Peter. 53, maybe 54 days after this, It is this same Peter who stands in front of a whole bunch of people and preaches the sermon at Pentecost from Acts chapter 2. Jesus would not, or Peter would not uh, say he knew Jesus around a campfire when asked by a young girl if he knew Jesus. 54 days later, well, how many people would he stand up in front of and preach? Well, 3,000 of them got saved that day. And so there was at least 3,000 people. God wasn't done with Peter yet. He stands in front of them. And if you read that sermon from Acts chapter 2, it is wonderful. It is a clear declaration of the gospel. And Peter just stands up and he delivers. When you get into Acts chapter 4, this same Jewish council that is trying Jesus on this night and condemning him to death that Peter is afraid of and won't even mention that he knows Jesus lest he gets dragged in front of this council. Read Acts chapter 4 later. Peter goes in front of that council and he lets them have the gospel full out. You, you killed the author of life, but God has raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of this fact. He's not afraid of that council anymore. Because Jesus wasn't done with him. Maybe you didn't know this about our namesake, St. Peter. Did you know he raised the dead? Go into Acts chapter 9. Maybe if you remember the old women's circles from the church, there is oftentimes the Dorcas circle. We always snickered about that when we were kids, right? What a terrible name, right? And then you actually read the story that uh, she dies and St. Peter comes and raises her from the dead. That's a long way in 54 plus days from Peter feeling like he was eternally condemned by his sin to being a bold proclaimer of the grace of Jesus Christ. Oh, Peter drank from that well. Jesus restores him on the beach Uh, about a week after Easter. He has a meal with him and commissions him uh, to feed my sheep, to feed my lambs. And Peter will spend the rest of his life uh, in joyous service of Jesus. He's not earned a bit of it, but he does it because he now understands who Jesus is and the grace and the mercy of God that Jesus was to him. Tonight, this is the grace of God shown in Jesus Christ, not only for St. Peter, but the same for you and the same for me. Praise God. Our hymn of the day will be number 294. My hope is built on nothing less. You can stand if you're able.
Christ's footsteps treading, pilgrims here, our home above, full of faith and hope and love. Let us do the Father's bidding, and so we pray. Gracious Father, we stand in awe and wonder at your abounding grace, which you've lavished on us through your Son, Jesus. That's why we celebrate where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Gracious Father, in Peter's failure, we see our own failure and sin. Too often we're spiritually dead, living in the reign of sin and death. But now, through Jesus, you make us alive and children of your great affection and grace. We delight to say, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Gracious Father, as lost as we are, as we get in guilt, so much more do you restore us in grace. Amazing, life-changing, overflowing grace. Grace planned for Jesus to be arrested, tried, condemned, crucified, buried, and risen for us. That's why we are eternally grateful, because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Indeed, gracious Father, this gospel shows us how fervently for us you really are. You did not spare your own son, but gave him up for us all. How will you not do also, along with Jesus, graciously give us all things? Jesus, let me faithful be, life eternal grant to me. Amen. Lord Jesus, remember us always in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites us to walk with him to the Garden of Gethsemane, a place of great suffering, but also a place of great love. We will walk with Jesus all the way to the empty tomb and to the resurrection victory. Let us ever walk with Jesus. We'll need your blue hymnal for our final hymn, number 721.
and serve the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Keep it going.